Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly briefing. As always, we'll hear from public health, uh, and then we also have folks from engineering and streets here to talk about a range of sustainability-related things. Uh, rain gardens and recycling is the theme for the day. I want to just recognize a couple of events going on. Um, we are still in Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. I encourage you to take advantage of the um, materials that are available at our great Madison Public Libraries to educate yourself there. We're also in Mental Health Awareness Month. Please, please, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, avail yourself of the mental health resources available in our community. It's been a really hard year, and we all need a little support uh, on the mental health front, I think. Also, it is Bike Safety Month and National Clean Air Month. As I said last week, those things go together in my mind. Um, so get out there on your bike, do it safely, make sure you're all tuned up. Um, it is also Nurses Week. And uh, I think we should all pause and take a moment to thank the amazing nurses in our community uh, for getting us through the last year. I'll be going to a couple of events uh, this week and next to thank nurses and um, just Really worth it. If you if you are a nurse, thank you. If you know a nurse, uh, thank one. Um, just put it out there in the community. They deserve a lot of love this week and every week. Um, all right, so without further ado, we're going to go to our public health update, and we'll move on from there. So Janelle Heinrich, Director of Madison Dane County Public Health. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here this week to report another week of encouraging news for Dane County when it comes to the fight against COVID-19. COVID activity, as measured by trends in cases, vaccination, and testing, indicates that we are in the longest period of relative stability since spring of 2020. We attribute this in part to our steady phased approach to reopening, with emergency order number 16 now in effect, and in part to the great work Dane County is doing to get vaccinated. Our county is seeing the highest vaccination rates in the state with 60.5% having at least one dose of vaccine. Our current seven day average is 49 cases per day. When I was here last week, it was 62. Overall, we're seeing stable hospitalizations with an average of 37 people hospitalized with COVID. Last week, that number was 33. Though this week the number is a little higher, this does not represent a statistically significant increase. It does, however, serve as a reminder that while we're making great progress, COVID is a serious disease, and some of our community members are still being significantly impacted. The positivity rate for Dane County right now is 1.7%, and that's including the testing in cases that is happening on the UW campus. Over the past month, there has been a decrease in cases among those ages 12 to 29 and those ages 40 to 59. All other age groups are holding steady. Next week will be FEMA's last week with us at the Alliant Energy Center. With their help, we have been able to expand vaccination capacity, which has allowed us to expand coverage um, and get more shots in arms and nimble in the way that we do it this past month. We are grateful for the additional support that they have provided our community. We continue to wait for official word from the FDA regarding expanding emergency use authorization to administer the Pfizer vaccine for children between the ages of 12 to 15. Everything we are hearing right now indicates that it is quite likely that this approval may happen next week. This means 25,000 to 30,000 more people in our county will become eligible for vaccination, and it will help us get closer to herd immunity. If and when that happens, we will be inviting this age group to get their vaccine at the Alliant Energy Center. As with everyone coming to the Alliant for a vaccine, no appointment is required. However, it is highly recommended especially as our eligibility group expands, um, 
Lines for the no appointment or drop-in lanes will get longer. The best way to ensure you are in and out as quickly as possible is to make an appointment. Parents, we also encourage you to check with your child's doctor about setting up a vaccine appointment first. We published a blog this morning which has all the details that parents of children ages 12 to 15 should know ahead of any possible announcement. You can find that at publichealthmdc.com slash blog. Here's where we stand right now when it comes to vaccinations. 548,155 doses have been administered to Dane County residents. As I said earlier, 60.5% of our county has received at least one dose and 46.5% of Dane County residents are now fully vaccinated. Our 65 and older population continues to lead by example with 93.4% having one dose and 88.8% being fully vaccinated. We are also seeing wonderful progress in the 16 to 17 year old age group with almost 60% having at least one dose. Because a younger group of people could be eligible for vaccine as soon as next week, we encourage folks who are 16 and older who haven't gotten vaccinated yet to beat the rush and get vaccinated this week if you're able. We still have 400 appointments available at the Alliant Energy Center through Saturday, and there are many more options for getting vaccinated throughout the county. Head on over to publichealthmdc.com slash vax, V-A-X, to find more options. And a reminder, Emergency Order 16 took effect yesterday. To quickly recap, the biggest changes impact gathering limits and capacity limits, which have both increased. Indoor gatherings with food and drink is, are now limited to 350 people. And without food and drink, that limit is 500 people or less with physical, physical distancing. For outdoor gatherings, there are no specific limits as long as people who do not live together are able to maintain physical distancing. Restaurants and taverns indoor dining capacity may open up to 75% of approved capacity with physical distancing. And businesses must limit the number of individuals inside their establishment to 75% of approved capacity limits levels indoors with physical distancing. This new order remains in effect until June 2nd. We are thrilled to be able to continue our phased reopening, but just because you can do these things doesn't mean that there is zero risk associated with them, especially if you are not vaccinated. As an individual or family, you may need to make stricter choices based on your comfort with risk. The more vaccination coverage we have across Dane County and our state, the more we continue to reduce our risk as individuals and a community, and the faster we continue our return to normal. Thanks for all that you are doing, Dane County. Stay well. Thank you, Janelle. Just remember, folks, public health MDC dot com slash vax vax get those appointments get those shots in arms all right next we have hannah molininski from our engineering division to talk about ways that we can beautify our city and help keep our lakes clean hannah All right. Good morning, everyone. Pretty timely this morning since we got some rain this morning in some areas of our area. Today, we want to talk about ways you can get involved this spring and summer when it comes to our environment while helping support our stormwater infrastructure system. Okay, so before we get into those options, let's establish first what we mean when I say stormwater infrastructure. Our stormwater... Our stormwater infrastructure is the system that carries surface water in and out of our area. 
That includes precipitation like snow and rain to all that water that flows through area lakes and rivers. All the water has to go somewhere. And if it can't go into the ground naturally, we can help by creating rain gardens and improving medians in our community among other options and ideas. So today I'm going to give you a couple of options and resources to support you to get started in your yard, your backyard, your neighborhood traffic median. So let's talk rain gardens. So rain garden, a rain garden is a garden of native shrubs, perennials, flowers planted in a shallow depression, which sometimes is built on a natural slope. Rain gardens are often designed to capture and infiltrate water into the ground. So a rain garden is a great option for stormwater management as it temporarily holds and soaks in the rainwater runoff that flows from roofs, driveways, patios, or lawns. So take a look at this map. We have a 1,000 rain garden goal for our city, and we are asking residents, you at home, to plant rain gardens, snap a photo, email it in to us, post it online, whatever you can do to get that, and help us build out this map. Right now, we have 624 rain gardens recorded in the city of Madison, but with your help, we can reach our 1,000 rain garden goal. Rain gardens do not have to be expensive. Rain gardens can be as big or as little as you like, and they can take as much or as little work to upkeep. Really anything at this point will help our stormwater system. So this is a really great resource for you, available right now on our engineering website, especially for anyone wanting to build on a budget. So if you click over to the City of Madison engineering website, soon to be updated with even more resources, um, but you can click on this $100 rain garden guide, how to build a rain garden in under 100 bucks. There's also plant lists and more. So this guide, I'm gonna give you a little taste of it right now. You can see this first page. And then here's the back. So the rain garden guide explains everything from defining the boundary to digging, plant selection and maintenance, where you should build on your lawn and even more than that. So a really great resource for you on the engineering website. Finally, for rain gardens, we have also a 20 minute podcast episode called Rain, Rain, Go in My Garden on Everyday Engineering on iTunes and Google Play. It breaks down what you need to know to build your own rain garden. Okay, now on to option number two, the Adopt a Medium program. So the other way you can get involved and grow your green thumb this spring and summer is through the Adopt a Median program. So this program is really a fun way to take pride in your neighborhood. Um, and the Adopt a Median program is a program for our community to take care and maintain existing traffic calming circles and medians across the city. So there are 650 medians in the city right now. 225 of them are residential street medians. And of those 225, 65 are adopted. So that remaining 160 are either available for adoption, maintained by neighborhood associations, anonymous volunteers that we often hear about through the grapevine. And really that's not all of the help that we have. So that's where you can help us. So we'd like you to be like Judy. So uh, Judy is an adopte adopter, um, but eligible medians include any residential traffic median in a 25 mile per hour or less speed limit area, has an existing planting bed within city limits and has not been adopted yet. So this is Judy, a Madison resident and adopter. We're proud of her work with her median. Uh, you can join in on that fun as well. Anyone can apply to adopt a median. We encourage everyone to apply and work with our city staff through the process. And then our adopters have a wide range of skills and backgrounds. This can be neighborhood associations, groups, businesses, volunteers, you name it. And then Finally, the adopt a median application is up on the engineering division website right now. And if you have any questions about any of the resources I talked about today, of course, you can connect with us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, or even just email us at engineer at cityofmadison.com. Thank you, Ohana. I hope that folks will take a look at those programs. Uh, I love seeing those rain gardens out on our streets, and I really appreciate the folks in my neighborhood who have adopted the medians and planted them in all sorts of pretty flowers. 
All right, next we have Brian Johnson, who's uh, from our streets division, and he's going to talk about recycling and our ever popular Recyclopedia. Brian? So, hello. So, yeah, as the, as the mayor had previewed here at the Streets Division, every couple of years we put together this booklet. This, we call it the Recyclopedia. It really explains all of the stuff that the Streets Division does, but it also includes a big chunk about how to recycle the right way in our homes. And it includes an extensive list of stuff in the back about what to do with all the various things in our lives. I hear a lot that recycling is complicated. It's not so much the recycling is complicated, but the stuff in our lives certainly is. And uh, where to get these booklets, you can download a digital copy as a PDF off the Streets Division website. Physical copies are available at the public libraries in the vestibule areas where the tax documents and stuff are. Um, I have them in a few other public places I can find to house them. You can also contact the Streets Division to request a copy mailed to you. Um, you can just send us an email at streets at cityofmadison.com or call the Streets Division office that services your home. So if you live east of South Park Street, so the Isthmus and all points east, you want to call 608-246-4532. And if you live west of South Park Street, you want to call the West Side Streets Division office. That number is 608-266-4681. And the, excuse me, <laughs> sorry. The other thing I was going to talk about, the link doesn't appear to pull up. So, <laughs> the um, um, the um, when other, uh, since we talked, the the Recyclopedia does cover a lot of the other streets division services, including our brush pickup, our yard waste pickup, but also our large item collection is in there, and also what items um, require fees. Now, with the large item pickup, is something we just announced this morning that we are changing. Instead of our current system, we're going to be going to a work order system by the end of this month. Really what residents will need to do, as opposed to just setting stuff out to the curb and expecting crews to roll by, they're gonna to have to submit a work order for us so our crews know what homes have stuff out so we can be more deliberate and go to those specific homes along those stops. The, um, the reason why we've changed this is that right now with our collection, we spend a lot of time looking for things to pick up, where we're just sort of roving through the city looking for things. But with this work order system, we can be far more efficient and far more deliberate. Um, one of the benefits of having this work order system, too, is that as recycling opportunities expand, we'll be able to have more information about what we pick as large items that we might be able to find a beneficial home for on the back end. Like a good example would be mattress recycling. If we were able to provide that service once again, if we know what homes have uh, mattresses, we can send out a truck just to get those mattresses to those stops so we can deliver them to a recycler without having to separate them from the uh, material, from the other stuff that we can't recycle yet. The, um, that particular change, the work order system will be live and available to the public on the Streets Division website at the end of May. So May 28th is whenever you'll be able to see it, then you can access it, because we're gonna make this change. The work order system starts June 1. So June 1st, 2021, you're gonna have to do this work order system. Um, so you can go to the website, but if you have trouble with the, the website, you can't get the address system to work, things like that, certainly give the Streets Division a call. We can get you in the work order system that way as well, and just call that Streets Division office that services your home. I intended to show a preview, but the link doesn't seem to be working right now, so um, it, it works fine for just some, the, the, I know it's, it's a bad look trying to show technology as a preview and I can't get the link to pull up, but I promise you by May 28th, it will work just fine. And there'll be multiple links on the Streets Division website as well. And there'll be more news releases coming out um, up until May 28th. They'll let people know what to expect, what to do, what it's gonna look like. We, right now on the Streets Division website, we have an FAQ or just answering the questions that people might have about what that system's gonna look like. You can find that at cityofmadison.com slash streets. So I think, and I already gave the mayor her copy of the Recyclopedia, so she's good to go with that. But I'll leave this one up here for you too, just in case you want to take another look. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. And yes, got to get yourself one of these, um, whether you get them in paper or uh, just look online. Very useful document. Um, all right, I have a whole bunch of stuff to go through today. We'll try and work through it quickly uh, and then get to questions. 
I just want to start out by reiterating how deeply disappointed I am that a minority of the city council voted against establishing a safe, secure, and purpose-built shelter for men experiencing homelessness in our community. Um, staff will go back to the drawing board and start looking for other possible sites, but there is no doubt that the council's vote will postpone construction for at least another year and increase our costs for housing homeless men this upcoming winter. I'm committed to working with our partners at the county uh, and in the nonprofit sector to make a purpose-built shelter a reality. Uh, and it's really unfortunate that we have to deal with this setback, um, but we will press through uh, and do all we can to make sure that we are creating the system to serve our uh, folks that are experiencing homelessness that we need here in Madison. Um, on that topic, I do just want to note a couple of things. Um, I'm happy to say that in a few weeks, the Salvation Army is ready to begin moving up to 35 families from temporary uh, housing into a much more hospitable shelter location on Milwaukee Street. Uh, we purchased this facility recently, the city did, and, and we have worked really hard um, to convert it from a former nursing facility into a welcoming family shelter. I think this experience shows that with hard work, time, and some money, we can create safe places for people who are experiencing homelessness to connect with resources. Uh, the Salvation Army plans to operate out of this space on Milwaukee Street for the next three to five years as they prepare to redevelop their East Washington site into a modern purpose-built shelter to better serve families and single women. I, again, we need the same thing uh, for men experiencing homelessness. And while these plans were being brought to life, uh, the city has obviously taken additional steps to protect single men from COVID, first with our temporary shelter at Warner Park and then with our temporary shelter on First Street. Uh, and I do want to note that our shelters have hosted vaccination clinics and that we are working hard to make sure that all folks who are experiencing homelessness in Madison have access to the vaccine. And I want to thank public health in particular for their work on that. Uh, and in uh, another episode of legislators behaving badly, uh, as of March, legislators in 47 states across this country have introduced no fewer than 361 bills to restrict access to voting. This is according to the Brennan Center for Justice. The Washington Post characterized this unprecedented stampede of bills as the most sweeping contraction of ballot access in the United States since the end of Reconstruction, when Southern states curtailed the voting rights of formerly enslaved black men. Wisconsin is no exception, unfortunately. Legislators have introduced dozens of bills that make it harder not easier for voters to cast their ballots. Bills have been introduced in the Wisconsin legislature that would bar many of the best practices that Wisconsin cities, towns, and villages developed to keep voters safe during the COVID-19 pandemic, and they would create a swath of new criminal penalties impacting voters and voting officials in the complete absence of fraud or misconduct related to the 2020 elections. Just one example. Senate Bill 209, Assembly Bill 177 uh, impacts our ability to have ballot drop boxes. Last year, in the preparation for a huge influx of absentee ballots due to the pandemic, the City of Madison installed permanent ballot drop boxes at 13 locations on city property, predominantly at our fire stations. Instead of making funds available to every community so they could similarly make voting safe and accessible, these bills would force Madison to rip out our 13 ballot drop boxes and only have one at the city clerk's office. There's really no explanation for this absurdity. Communities across the nation have safely utilized ballot drop boxes for years, not just during a pandemic, but they have been particularly important during the pandemic. And in the middle of that pandemic, the Wisconsin State Legislature has failed to take any action to aid localities that are charged with administrating elections. 
When election workers were quitting by the thousands, the legislature did not provide funds to help clerks with absentee ballots, postage, drop boxes, or protective equipment. They stood by as election officials across the state struggled to do their best and preserve election integrity under extraordinary conditions. And now with no evidence of wrongdoing on the part of any election official, the legislature is inappropriately attempting to pass bills containing a series of new felony charges that apply to Wisconsin's respected clerks and election officials. It's my view, and I believe the view of the city of Madison, that our state election officials and poll workers are among the heroes of this pandemic, who worked tremendously long hours to protect our democracy and voting rights in a time of crisis in a nonpartisan and professional manner. It is, perhaps ironically, the week that we appreciate our clerks, uh, our municipal clerks across uh, the state and the nation. Um, these bills are an insult to that week, but I want all of our clerks to know how much I appreciate you, and particularly how much I appreciate your extreme dedication to keeping a fair and safe election system running in the city of Madison and across the state of Wisconsin. All right, other things that are going on this week. There's a lot of recognitions uh, this week. Um, the City of Madison has recognized National Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Awareness Day for the first time yesterday. The Senate uh, first recognized this day in 2018, and it's an attempt to shine a light on the very high rate of homicides and gender-based violence among Native American and Alaska Natives throughout the United States and Canada. This crisis impacts girls, women, and two-spirit people from across the country. We know that it's difficult to track these crimes, uh, both across the nation and here in Madison, but we do know that indigenous women are disproportionately targets of gender-based violence, and this needs to be recognized and stopped. Hopefully, recognizing this day will shine a spotlight on the issue and uh, help us to make progress on it. The Madison Municipal Building will be lit up in red the week, this week of May 5th to bring awareness to the issue and to honor the victims and their families throughout the country. And uh, at our last council meeting, the count Common Council passed a resolution recognizing this day. In other news, uh, just an update on our guaranteed income pilot program here in Madison. Uh, I want to thank the local donors that have helped us raise over uh, $300,000 to contribute to the pilot. So thank you to UW Health, CUNA Mutual Group, the Dan and Patty Rashke Family Foundation, TASC, American Family Insurance, the Alliant Energy Foundation, and the Give Back Foundation for your partnership. Um, this project will lift up Madison's families and provide proof of concept for a national guaranteed income program. We are closer with these funds to being able to roll out the program for participants here in Madison, uh, but we are not yet enrolling anybody, so stay tuned for more information on that. In fun news, uh, Ride the Drive is coming to neighborhoods near you this year. Our tradition continues. Uh, we took a pause in 2020, and we're getting creative in 2021 to make sure that Ride the Drive can keep going. Um, to help us better uh, disperse folks uh, due to COVID, we are doing four different neighborhood events for this year's Ride the Drive. Uh, it will be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Sunday, June 6th, uh, and there will be uh, two mile or less routes that loop around a park. Uh, those parks are Kennedy Park, Marlboro Park, Warner Park, and Wingra Park. Um, so we will be closing streets uh, around these parks to allow folks to stroll, roll, pedal, or glide along the routes without motor vehicles. Um, and with four events happening at the same time, we are going to need nearly 600 volunteers um, to step up and help us. So if you live on or near a road uh, or are in the neighborhood, we hope that you'll volunteer uh, at one of these parks. Each volunteer does receive a coveted Ride the Drive t-shirt, um, and most positions are just two-hour shifts, which would still allow you to participate in Ride the Drive. 
We need bike ambassadors, set up and clean up crews, info booth and t-shirt sales uh, staffers, and the greatest need will be intersection guides. We need more than 400 intersection guides um, to fill uh, shifts, and those are either 90-minute or two-hour shifts. We encourage individuals, families, uh, and local companies and other organizations to volunteer, and you can register online at the Parks Department website. Visit ridethedrive.com for more information, please. We could use your help. Um, I do want to note one street closure coming up uh, starting at 7 a.m. on Saturday, May 8th, and continuing through 6 a.m. on Monday, May 10th. Uh, we will be closing right turns from southbound Park Street to Fish Hatch to complete some concrete repairs. Uh, this work is part of the larger South Park Street construction that's going on, and Metro Transit will close the adjacent bus stop uh, over the weekend. So just keep that in mind if you're traveling in that area. And speaking of traveling on our streets, as part of the city's Vision Zero initiative, our traffic and engineering division is uh, putting forward a new program called 20 is Plenty. The program is going to reduce the speed limit of our residential streets from 25 miles per hour to 20 miles per hour. We're doing this because research shows that speed plays a critical role in the outcome of a crash when it occurs. And according to a study by the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, if a vehicle is moving at 20 miles per hour and strikes a pedestrian, there is a 13% likelihood of fatality or severe injury compared to 40% at 30 miles per hour and 73% at 40 miles per hour. So clearly, slower speeds and lowering the speed limit can save lives. And this is a key component of the city's Vision Zero initiative. We're planning to do this citywide uh, in 2022, but we want to pilot it in a couple of neighborhoods sooner. So uh, we are looking at picking some neighborhoods to roll out this 20 is plenty program um, as soon as possible. The Transportation Commission uh, will choose those neighborhoods at a meeting this month, um, and we're hoping to, again, get that started uh, as soon as those neighborhoods are picked. These decisions and others involving Vision Zero will incorporate an equity lens as we work to improve safety throughout the city. And this is an ongoing initiative uh, that includes the speed limit reductions, but also crosswalk markings, targeting our high injury networks, and utilizing different engineering changes to keep us all safer. And as we work together, we are focused on keeping everyone safe, motorists, cyclists, and pedestrians. Please join us in our commitment to Vision Zero by obeying the speed limit, driving, biking, and walking safely around Madison. Together we can save lives. And it is important, each and every one of us, when we get behind the wheel, we can decide to follow the speed limit and we can set an example for others around us. We can reset what the normal traffic speed is on our streets. But it does take each and every one of us to do that. So please join us. Uh, all right. Um, other news, Brian already talked about the large item collection pickup. Thank you, Brian, for covering that. Uh, but I did want to note that the spring yard waste collection is complete. Um, so if you have yard waste, please, please bring it to our drop-off sites. Or perhaps you want to try composting or mulching your grass clippings into your lawn instead of making the trip to a, one of our yard waste sites. But if you do want to come to one of those sites, they are at 1501 West Badger Road, 4602 Sycamore Ave, and 402 South Point Road. The current hours are Monday and Friday from 7.30 a.m. to 2.45 p.m., Tuesday and Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., they're closed on Wednesday, but they're open on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And those are going to be the hours until December, so you can get used to them. Um, just a note that our peak times tend to be Saturday and Monday, uh, so if you can come at a different time to spread out the usage, that'd be great. More information is at the Streets Department website. That's cityofmadison.com streets. Check it out if you're interested. 
All right, yet another week. Women's Health Week is May 9th through 15th, uh, and we have an event that is uh, sponsored by the Madison Public Library, the Wisconsin Book Festival, and the All of Us Research Program at UW-Madison. We're offering two free virtual events focused on women's physical and mental health as it relates to pregnancy and motherhood. The events will cover similar content, uh, but one uh, will be in English and the other will be in Spanish. The event is titled Pregnancy, Birth, and Beyond, a conversation with community women about motherhood. The English event takes place on May 12th from 6 to 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. Uh, and the uh, en Espanol es el 13 de mayo a las 6 uh, de las 7 uh, uh, en la noche en Facebook Live. Um, and if you are interested in uh, participating, free paperback copies of Like a Mother by Angela Garbus will be mailed to attendees after the event. And there will be door prizes uh, of small items related to health and wellness at each event. These events continue the conversation from the Wisconsin Book Festival event uh, that featured uh, Angela Garbus and will, are part of the new chapters in community health events series. For more information, please visit MADPL. Madison Public Library, madpl.org slash new dash chapters. All right. Hannah tells me that it is Historic Preservation Month, and we are focused on the Gates of Heaven. Um, if you do not know Gates of Heaven, it is one of the oldest surviving synagogues in the nation. Uh, it's a beautiful building uh, located here in Madison. It was built in 1863. Uh, it's at James Madison Park on East Gorham. Uh, it's a locally, locally designated landmark and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Engineering is working on a restoration of this amazing building, and they're featuring uh, that restoration uh, throughout the month on social media and in video, and if I know Hannah, there's probably a podcast as well. Uh, so check that out. It's a beautiful building. Go visit it, but also um, tune in to learn about how we're trying to take care of this piece of Madison's and our nation's history. All right, that brings us to the community resources portion of today's briefing, as we do every week. I want to start by reminding you, publichealthmdc.com slash vax, V-A-X. Get yourself signed up. Uh, get your friends and family vaccinated. First you get the vaccine, then you get all the wonderful summer events that we all miss. Um, if you need help connecting to resources in our community, food options, housing, social services, please call United Way of Dane County at 211 or text your zip code to 898-211. The city also offers a financial resource hotline to help residents navigate issues related to COVID-19. You can find out more at cityofmadison.com slash financial hotline. Um, or you can give a call toll-free, 888-266-7805. If you're homeless or in danger of losing your housing, call our housing helpline at 608-264-0549 or email housinginfo at cityofmadison.com. For help with internet or phone connection, call the Public Service Commission at the state at 608-267-3595. For help connecting to child care providers, call 608-216-7022. You can still get health insurance through the healthcare.gov marketplace. Please, 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 if you don't have health insurance, get yourself covered. Um, that is healthcare.gov or call 211 or visit wiscovered.com for help signing up if you need to help navigate that marketplace. If you need help paying for your health insurance premiums through the marketplace, call 211 or visit unitedwaydanecounty.org slash healthconnect, healthconnect to see if you're eligible uh, for the Health Connect program. And if you need a computer to do any of these things. Um, you can visit one of our fantastic Madison Public Libraries. They have appointments for computer usage. Call 608-266-6300. 
All of these resources and more are posted at cityofmadison.com. Click on the community resources link on the home page, and you can find out more about all the things that I talked about today at cityofmadison.com slash mayor slash blog. While you're there, sign up to get that delivered into your inbox. We will end this week, as we always do, with upcoming meetings. So today, May 6th at 5, the Madison Public Library Board will meet. I believe that they are talking about when and how to reopen libraries. At 5 p.m. also, the Public Market Development Committee will meet. I don't know if they will talk about the First Street transition, but it uh, might be interesting to see. At 5.30, our Affirmative Action Commission will meet, and also at 5.30, our Community Development Block Grant Committee will meet. On Monday the 10th at 5.30 p.m., the Police and Fire Commission meets. Also at 5.30, the Plan Commission meets. On Tuesday the 11th at 5.30, the Madison Arts Commission meets. And on Wednesday the 12th at 4.30, the Urban Design Commission will meet at 5. The Transportation Commission will meet. Tune in uh, for more there about the 20 is Plenty initiative. And at 5.30, the Education Committee will meet. And last but certainly not least, uh, um, coming up on May 12th, it is Eid. So I would like to wish in advance anybody who celebrates Eid Mubarak um, and please take care of yourselves and your friends and family. Linda, I think we have questions. We do, and all of them are for you. All right, then. Okay. The first question says, regarding the Vision Zero initiative, is there any idea of which areas of Madison you will test the 20 mile per hour speed limit on? Will it focus on a neighborhood near a school or park? How long will the test run last before applying the speed limit changes to other neighborhoods? Excellent question. Um, as I said, the Transportation Commission will be choosing the neighborhoods uh, where this is applied first. Um, I would imagine they will take into account um, safe routes to schools uh, and other factors, uh, but it, it will be up to them to uh, pick those neighborhoods. We'll roll this out first, um, and then we are planning to go citywide with our implementation in 2022. And the next question is, given the City Council's vote on Tuesday regarding the Zaya Road property, what comes next for the permanent men's homeless shelter? What directions are you giving city staff regarding next steps in a site search? What options are in place for a temporary shelter given that there could be gaps between how long the first street property can be used with the public market coming online and the opening of a permanent shelter? These are all excellent questions, and I wish I had better answers to them. Um, I think all options are on the table at this point. Um, we are going to regroup. Uh, city staff are going to take a look at what is available out there now um, and go back to the drawing board in terms of evaluating different sites, um, their cost, their time frame, uh, what it would cost to renovate uh, them, and so we're just we're going back to square one, and we're going to try again. Um, in terms of the First Street location, I mean, I got to be honest. I think that this, the vote by the City Council, um, by a minority of the City Council, makes it really difficult um, to manage that time frame. We do not have another option for a temporary shelter at this point in time. Um, so I think that uh, again, this vote by the minority of the City Council really puts. Um, the public market time frame uh, in jeopardy, which is uh, disappointing um, to me and I'm sure to many other people. Um, so, you know, we're going to keep working on it. We are committed. I am committed to having a purpose-built um, shelter for men experiencing homelessness, but uh, we're going to have to really look at our options um, and hopefully find a path forward that does this as expeditiously as possible, uh, but also gets us um, what we ultimately need in the long run. Thank you, Mayor. Those are the questions for today. All right. Well, thank you again to Janelle and Hannah and Brian for joining us, and thank you all for tuning in. I hope everybody has a great week, and we will see you next week.